Hello, everybody, and welcome to Limited Level Ups. I'm Alex, and this week's episode, we're taking a trip back to talking about Karlov Manor. I know a lot of other podcasts are doing their format send-off episodes this week, so it's kind of odd for me to be like, oh, back to MKM, when everybody's kind of wrapping up the format. But I know there are a lot of players that are still actively drafting this format. It's a pretty good one, so we still have a lot of people in the player base being like, yeah, I'm just still jamming. A lot of people have told me they want a bit of a format update and how to best approach the format now that it's kind of a, a mature format. And let's Luckily, I do actually think I have quite a bit to share, even at this point in the format. I've been winning a lot. Uh, not, you know, not to brag here, but I've been winning quite a bit in the past two weeks. More than I usually do at this point in the format. And I've actually won more in the past two weeks than I had been like the first month or so of the format. In my last 15 drafts, nine of them have been trophies and the rest of them have been mostly above four wins. And I don't think that's just a fluke. My approach to the format has morphed a bit as the weeks have gone on, pun intended, of course. And so today's episode is going to be basically just sharing my updated takes on the format, what decks I've been leaning towards. I guess sort of think of this as like a state of the format address episode, just one that's addressing week seven of the format rather than addressing week two of the format. And as always, a quick shout out here to the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited level ups. That is the number one place you can go if you want to support this podcast, this YouTube channel, any of my content really does help the show keep on running. There's a bunch of tiers over there that you can sign up for with a bunch of benefits, all focused on getting you better at limited magic in one way or another. So go check that out if you're interested either in supporting the show or leveling up your game as a limited player. So just before we dive into the specifics of how I've been drafting murders lately, I do want to inject just a slight bit of general limited level ups content, some stuff that you can apply to any draft format um, and just bounce around a few ideas that describe a few dynamics that I think are at play when you're participating in these late format drafts. Something that I heard once that's always stuck with me, uh, from friend of the show Ryan Sachs, long time ago said this to me, said something along the lines of good drafters, they, they know how to win consistently when a new format comes out. You know, like you often see good drafters uh, just kind of jump into a format and kind of know what to, to do, even though maybe they don't know the cards that well. But great drafters know how to win consistently on week 11 of the format, which is basically just speaking to the idea that draft formats do continue to evolve even late into the format, and the great drafters know how to adapt to that evolution. You'll sometimes hear people say in, you know, like some way of a pessimistic or hyperbolic way, they'll go like, oh, you know, it's week one of the format or week two of the format, and it's already solved. You know, like we know that red and white are so good, and 17 lands says that red and white are the best deck, and there's nothing more to it. I, actually, Karloff Manor is a really good example of that, since red and white was such a dominant deck on week one. But I hear that and I always think, well, that's what's happening on week one of the format. That's true. It's a very good deck. But people are going to start noticing that they're getting smashed in by red, white aggro every game. And they're going to start drafting it. And that deck's going to be much harder to draft. And you're going to face it less often. There's also just the fact that this isn't constructed where you just bring to the tournament whatever cards or deck you think is the best deck. There's a draft element in limited where not only, you know, breathing and thinking human beings have an effect on your draft, but also what cards are in the pack, just that kind of variance element, that's going to have a profound effect on the decks that people at your table end up drafting. Now, a given draft format isn't going to be drastically different on week eight compared to what it was like on week two. You're still playing the same cards, but it's often different enough that if you are drafting like you did in the early days of the format, you're going to lose more than the people who start to adjust to how the draft format changes over the weeks. And sort of conveniently, talking about draft meta evolution is pretty topical now that play boosters are how we're drafting formats because some formats don't evolve. And the formats that don't evolve are the ones that tend to have a smaller card pool. And of course, all draft formats have pretty much the same number of cards, like, you know, 260 or something like that. But it can be artificially smaller when there's too many junky commons or when one color is completely unplayable, it's just like so much worse than the other one. So you just don't really consider those cards. And because there's not as many cards in the card pool, it's just like, well, I'm only working with 100 cards or 150 cards instead of the full 250. So there's just less room for things to change. But in the world of play boosters, where an explicit goal of play boosters is to make it so that there are more playable cards in the pack, more of the commons matter. I think going forward, we're going to have more formats like MKM, where I feel like on week six or seven of the format, I'm drafting it quite a bit differently than I was at the beginning of the format, which I think is good, right? It just means that the, the format's going to have a little more longevity. You're going to have a different draft experience on week seven than you're going to have on week two. Like just as a quick comparison, I think that this format had a lot more longevity than something like Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And I think I attribute that a lot of that to the 
the fact that there's very, very few unplayable commons. Like, I went through the list, and I really only came up with, like, four or five. Like, we've got Magnifying Glass, which is the three-man artifact that makes clues and taps for mana. We've got Behind the Mask, which is the single blue instant that makes something either a 4-3 or a 1-1 if you've collected evidence. Uh, Cerebral Confiscation, which is the Mind Rot, which, you know, could be a sideboard card. And Agency Coroner, which is a 5-mana 3-6 in black that sacrifices a creature to draw cards. And even these cards aren't just, like, stone blank unplayable. Like, I've put Behind the Mask in my deck before, and every other common in the set I've played pretty extensively. I would say at least two or three times. But then you look at Ixalan, and I'm not going to read out all the cards that I pulled aside here, but there's about 15 commons that I would very much not like to put in basically any of my draft decks. Like 15 commons that are about on the level of Magnifying Glass or Agency Corner. Like I could see you playing it and it wouldn't be completely stone blank piece of cardboard. They don't really make cards like that these days, but cards you were not happy to play. So all of this is just to say that all the things that I'm about to talk about, kind of the factors, the dynamics at play when you're drafting a set a little bit later into a format, Keep your ears peeled for this next section because I think it's going to be much more relevant going forward. We're not going to have as many sets like Lost Caverns of Ixalan and Phyrexia OB1 where there wasn't as much format evolution. So let's get into some of these dynamics. And as a way to frame this, something that I think is really important to know is the largest factor at play here, why formats feel different and change and evolve as they go on, is because the average drafter at your table will be better later in the format compared to earlier, of course. Not just because people learn formats as they go on, but generally, you don't keep playing formats for weeks and weeks and weeks if you're losing all the time. So the weaker drafters sort of slowly leave the draft population, and all of a sudden, ta-da, you're at a table with a bunch of great drafters, or just above average drafters pretty often. I don't think it would be wrong to think about all of this less as what do late stage draft formats look like and a little more what do drafts look like when the table is full of strong players because I think there's a pretty large overlap between the two and you can kind of apply what we're about to talk about to kind of both scenarios. So the first thing I play here and it's one that I've already covered it's a big one it's one I talk about on the podcast quite often people are gonna know what the good cards are and the good decks are by about week two or week three of the format. The information advantage that you have as somebody who listens to podcasts, drafts a lot, maybe reads articles, knowing that, for example, in MCAM, Red White was the best deck, that advantage you have is going to diminish pretty quickly as the weeks go on, and you're going to have to broaden your horizons. So like on week one of the format, you get novice inspectors and neighborhood guardians going later than they should, and people would come to me the first week of the format and be like, oh, well, you know, what's the format like? What, what are the better decks? And I would just say, right now, just, just draft Red White because it's very open and people are passing the good cards. You can get into it pretty consistently. But then, at about, you know, that one and a half, two week mark, that kind of stuff really started to dry up. And it's important to notice when this happens, when you do have to start broadening your horizons, not just going into every draft assuming you're going to be red-white. And I, I definitely noticed this around a week or a week and a half in, where I just wasn't, you know, I had three drafts in a row, I just wasn't getting those decks that I had been consistently getting. And I had to dip into the green mid-range decks and explore those and figure out what those were like. Dive into the Insidious Root chalk outline kind of stuff. Figure out how to draft a good red-blue artifact deck. I think often people experience a dip in win rate at this time because they go into their drafts with the prior knowledge they had of like, okay, I kind of understand this format. Like yeah, almost a little bit embodying that person who's like, the format's all, it's just all about red-white. Going in expecting they can draft that deck and maybe even subconsciously thinking that the cards for other decks for the green mid-range decks and the red blue decks aren't as good like you might just devalue them even though they're strong cards thinking ah that's not what this format's about even though it will become what the format is about when the red white cards start going a little bit earlier and you get locks on eavesdroppers and bite down on crimes seventh eighth pick sometimes so your response to this generally should be number one not to go in expecting you're going to get that deck every single time but number two Add new tools to your tool belt. Figure out how to draft these decks. Watch some streams. Watch some YouTube videos. Look on 17 lands to figure out if there's cards that you're overvaluing or undervaluing. Because what happens if you do this is you get kind of jostled out of your, your week one impressions. And I think you start to notice more good cards in the pack or more options if you're broadening those horizons. Like it's very easy to, on week one of the format, kind of internalize the format is about these cards and these are the important cards you're looking at. You open your first pack, you go, okay, here's that neighborhood guardian or that three inspector. Maybe pack two, you get another good white card. And then pack three, it might not look like there's many good cards in the pack because you haven't primed yourself for noticing that, oh, hey, like I don't hate first picking Loxazon Eavesdropper or, hey, I will first pick a Detective Satchel because that's a really strong card for the 
the blue red deck and this idea of just broadening your horizons giving yourself more tools in your tool belt more decks that you are comfortable drafting with the longer the format goes on the more you should be willing to draft more color pairs because other people will then figure out oh hey the green mid-range decks are good and now you're fighting for the white aggro decks of some people and the green mid-range decks so you want to be the person that can snap up that blue red deck going around the table or maybe when you get deeper 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 into the format week seven some really off the wall thing i guess if you wanted a snappy way to put this you should be looking to quote unquote draft the hard way read your table a little bit more as the format goes on and exploit the format really take advantage of the cards that people don't know are good at the beginning parts of the format can't do that as much of course on week seven or eight of the format though so that's level one and i think that's intuitive to a lot of people the next thing though i think is a little bit less intuitive and it's that when you have a pot of good drafters people are more likely to switch lanes in the draft which means that you are going to end up in a spot that is different from where you started at least if, if you're drafting right and you're reading signals and you're figuring out what's coming to you you're gonna end up in a place that's different than you started more often as a format goes on compared to the first week or two of a format because the first week or two of the format even good players what they'll do is like i open up this rare let's try it out okay i'm just gonna take a good green card take a good blue card i guess i'm green blue and you know maybe those weren't the, the most open colors at their seat but you're still kind of just feeling up the cards and so you don't really know what you should pivot for you don't really know exactly how good each card is so when you get to pack one pick eight and you see an, an awesome red common and maybe it's a red common that you didn't think was that good something like person of interest right the, the four mana make a two two and make a two two suspected creature that's a card that i think was underrated for the first week or so that card maybe won't be on your radar as a great card and like i mentioned even good drafters won't pivot for those good cards going late because maybe they just don't know just yet or they haven't experienced with those cards but as the good cards become known quantities people know when to take risks in the draft people know when they should pivot and so when you get into a later stage of the format draft where you've got a lot of strong drafters you're gonna have people bobbing and weaving you're gonna feel a little bit confused about the signals you're gonna be like oh man what's happening here i don't really understand well like nothing seems to be open and feeling like no particular color is just straight up open is going to happen much more often as the format goes on and you need to be prepared number one just to expect that right kind of just anticipate that but two you need to react to that accordingly in these late format drafts there often won't be just an untouched lane so i don't think you should go looking for one i think for a lot of players they kind of see the goal of draft is to find the most open lane like whether whatever color combination is just like flashing blinking lights this is the one you should be drafting and at some point in the draft that'll come to you but really the true goal of draft is to draft the best deck in your seat possible and sometimes that lines up with the flashing red lights just like yep this is the deck that's open you should you should move in sometimes that is what leads you to that best deck but it's not always going to and you shouldn't expect it to when you're drafting on later weeks of the format so since you are going to have to pivot you're gonna to have to bob and weave you're gonna to have to really be vigilant and aware of what the good cards coming to you are to figure out the colors you're supposed to be in i put a really high priority on flexibility in the draft and flexibility can mean a few things it can mean number one just taking fixing a bit higher so i already valued escape tunnel pretty highly early in the format but now it's just like i'm happy to third pick the card or gravestone strider even this is a card that i don't mind taking in the middle of the pack the two mana one three that uh, can filter your mana to add a mana of any color like both of these cards help you play more good cards that you see later in the draft and another layer on top of this is because there's not going to be as many good cards kind of flying around the table you're going to have to get a bit scrappier sometimes your average playable is going to be a little bit worse and that incentivizes you to splash a little bit more to get more good cards into your deck and i'm sure this is something that most people have noticed if they draft formats on on week four five six your average deck is going to look like a less streamlined less awesome version of whatever color pair you are because once again it comes back to people are taking the good cards people know what's up i, I think that's a good thing to do like a, a general trend for me as formats go on is i tend to play more colors in my deck on average as the format goes on like this is a bit of an exception in mkm because it's like a you know pseudo multi multicolored format i'd say about half of my decks these days are splashing at least one color in murders but even something like phyrexia all be one i remember that's one of the things that i'd kind of been dipping my toe into 
was playing like four colored X in that format because in Phyrexia, one of the problems was a lot of the commons just weren't very good. So you needed a way to get a bunch of good cards into your deck. So you weren't just left playing, you know, the, the medium pick seven, pick eight cards that you'd get in two colors. Another way you can be flexible is taking good colorless cards when you see them or good hybrid cards, cards that are a little bit easier to get into your deck. Sanitation Automaton, the two mana two one that surveils one when it comes in. This is a card that, you know, I'm not happy to take third, fourth pick, but if I see one seventh pick, and there's nothing else great in the pack. I'm like, okay, that fills in my two drop slot. I'm going to play it. And I get to upgrade this later in the draft. You know, my colors end up being open. I get to upgrade my two drop. Great. But this does sort of delay the decision, figuring out what colors you're going to move into as the draft goes on. A few more ways to be flexible, taking good monocolor cards over good gold cards. Here's an example of a pick I had not too long ago. Pick one, pack one. I had War Leader's Call. That's the one red, white enchantment that pumps your team, gives them plus one, plus one, and then pings your opponent when a creature comes in. And Killer Among Us. We all know Killer Among Us, of course. And I think these cards are pretty close in power. War Leader's Call is a little bit better, but Killer Among Us is just so much more flexible. It's only one color. It's splashable if I want it to. I suppose War Leader's Call is also splashable, but a deck that really maximizes on War Leader's Call probably isn't a deck that splashes your, your aggro deck more likely. You can also apply this to double pipped cards, right? Something like the case of the burning masks, the three mana case, one red red that deals three. And then if you've dealt damage by, with from three sources, you can uh, solve the case. Then you can draw a card off the case. This is a card that I've moved down in my pick order as the format's gone on because it's just a little bit more inflexible. You have to be heavier red to be able to cast this card in a timely fashion. What I've observed happens in early format drafts is that people lock into their color pair I would say uh, about the middle of pack one or maybe the end of pack one. Again, they don't exactly know what the best things are. They don't know when to pivot. People don't often pivot early in the format or they pivot a little bit less often. So wherever they started drafting pack one, they continue to draft those colors pack two and pack three. And that locking point is important because if people are on average locking in, you know, the end of pack one, middle pack one, you're going to start to see good cards after that point. What I mean by that is, because people are locked in at that point, they're going to have to pass cards that are the best card in the pack a little more often because they're just like, okay, I locked into red, white. I can't take this awesome green, white, gold card that I saw. So maybe you get past the Tulsa Mirror in pack two. But in later format drafts, when people are better at drafting, are more comfortable bobbing and weaving, know when they should pivot, know when it's worth taking a risk on a, a good rare somewhere. There's a lot more fuzziness. There's a lot more just entropy in the drafts until a later point. So that lock-in point isn't going to be end of pack one, and then you get a bunch of good cards coming to you that if you've been flexible, you can reap the rewards of pack two and pack three. That lock-in point, I think, more comes like middle of pack two or maybe beginning of pack two. So instead, the good cards you're going to see, where, like, you know, where you get paid out in the draft, quote-unquote, is going to be the end of pack two and pack three. And that doesn't give you a lot of time to react to that, right? It's very difficult to pivot in into the best colors that you're seeing in pack three if you were inflexible. Like, you could very much end up in a situation where you were drafting a let's just say red white deck. I've been using red white a lot, but I think it's a good example. You're drafting a red white deck pack one and you know, it was reasonably open. And then pack two, you're like, okay, I'm not getting something, anything amazing, but I, it's open enough to keep drafting. But then pack three, it was just completely cut. Somebody moved in under you and you're like, oh, what was I to do? Like, how was I supposed to avoid that? Well, sometimes there's not ways to avoid that. But if you locked in earlier than you should have in pack one because you weren't flexible or you weren't taking fixing or you were taking inflexible cards over more flexible cards, you're going to have a much tougher time pivoting because you have less time to pivot because that overall table lock-in point is a little bit later in the draft. And in later stage drafts, this is compounded because people aren't going to just pass you good cards in the early pack. So you need to actually be able to get paid out in pack three get some good cards, read your seat. Because it's likely that the cards you picked up in pack one, you, you just don't have that many great cards like you would on week one of the format. And, and that was a lot of words. So if it was a lot to digest, I think you can just boil this down to the later it is in the format, the more flexible you should be in pack one because everybody else is going to be flexible. I, I would not be surprised at a, a good draft table. Most players have like three or four colors of cards by the end of pack one. There's not going to be this very clear lane that's open because people are trying to be flexible. They're just taking the best card in the pack regardless of color and so you need to play nicely you need to be flexible as well and then you can figure out what's open later pack two beginning of pack three that's when you can really lock in and then i think my final generic tip on this is do pay attention to the cards that even good players tend to underrate one of the reasons that i end up in green a lot in mkm is the this trifecta of three good green commons that i think even good drafters are underrating 
V2 Gauzy Inspector, the two mana 1 3 that puts a counter on something and gains two life if you collect evidence 6. Bite down on crime, the, the bite spell, and locks it on eavesdropper. The four mana three three comes in with a clue. I would say all three of these cards are underrated. Bite down and locks it on maybe a little bit less than the inspector. But you wheel inspector quite often, and it's a two drop that I'm not sad to take early. I mean, I don't have to take early, but if everybody drafted it pretty highly, I would not be sad to take it early. It's quite a strong card. Bite down on crime, locks it on eavesdropper. I think they go like a pick and a half on average later than they should. So you can really carve out a niche or carve out kind of a comfy home. If you are able to recognize these cards that people are still underdrafting, are still passing a little bit later than they should. It's almost like, you know, that information advantage I was talking about when people just don't know the good cards and you just get the sickest red white deck uh, week one every single time. It's almost like you get to gain that information advantage back a little bit. If you're the one who's not passing the good cards later than they should go, and are picking up the cards that other people are passing to you. All right, and without further ado, let's get into how I'm actually drafting the format at this point. And I do want to start off by saying this is definitely a bit more this is how Alex drafts the format rather than this is strictly the right way to draft the format at this point. I'm going to be a little bit more subjective than I usually am on, on normal episodes just talking about the format as a whole. I think if you wanted to replicate to a T what I'm doing, the, my approach to the format, you could do it. It's pretty doable. But also just feel free to pick apart bits and pieces and integrate them into how you like to draft. Pick parts you like and you know, there's things that I say that don't line up with how you like to draft. Then of course, only take the stuff that you feel is relevant for the way that you're drafting. Also, this might be slightly more stream of consciousness uh than, than i usually get so so bear with me i will try my best to make it as succinct as possible as we go so the decks i've been having a lot of success with are blue red and blue green in my last 15 drafts i have been those two colors either base those colors and maybe splashing a color or two more often splashing in, in the green blue deck of course i think above 70% of the time. I've had like a red white deck in there. I've had a, a couple base green with some black decks in there doing, you know, graveyard stuff, insidious root chalk outline stuff. But so much of the time, I just end up in base blue green or base blue red. The main reason being that all four of the gold uncommons for these two decks are really strong. And these are some of the cards that I think even the good players are underrating at this point. I'm getting them a little bit later than I think you ought to. So let me just go over them just to, as a refresher. We've got Detective Satchel, which is the four mana, two blue red artifact. When it enters, you investigate twice and you can tap it to make a Thopter if you've sacked an artifact this turn. Gleaming Gear Jake, this is the blue red one, one flyer that investigates when it enters and where if you sack an artifact, you put a plus one plus one counter on the gear drake notably this is taking the top spot as the top performing uncommon on 17 lands so just something to, to note evidence examiner this is the blue green 2-2 two -two, that on the beginning of your combat during your turn you can collect evidence for and whenever you collect evidence you investigate and repulsive mutation the x blue green counter spell put x plus one plus one counters on target creature you control then you can counter a spell unless this controller pays mana equal to the greatest power that you control all these cards are great all these cards are fantastic, and I'm happy to first pick them. I'm happy to six pick them, and that happens some amount of the time. So a lot of this is just the incentives that I'm seeing. I think these cards are underrated, along with green cards in general, I think still being underrated and, and blue cards, but we'll get to that when we get to that, the monocolor cards. And the thing that's great about this specific package of cards being undervalued is they all play very, very well together. Like, if you just pair any two of them, you'll find synergy within them, right? Detective Satchel makes clues, which triggers the gear drake. The evidence examiner makes more clues, so you can keep tapping your satchel. Having clues in play means that repulsive mutation, you can leave up your counter spell and have stuff to do with your mana. With the gleaming gear drake, of course, that clearly combos with the satchel. Also very, very good with Evans Examiner, so you can keep making artifacts. Also very good with Repulsive Mutation, because when you have a cheap, like, Delver-style threat, like Gear Drake, you want to protect it. You also have a really good vessel to put a bunch of plus one, plus one counters on your Gear Drake, and you can just one-shot your opponent a lot of the time. Evans Examiner, kind of the same, where it's a card that, as the game goes on, your opponent will often want to kill. Repulsive Mutation can stop that, of course. Detective Satchel draws you into more cards to get more cards into your graveyard, so you can keep collecting evidence. Like, it all just ties together in this beautiful package you might be thinking okay like why do you care about all these cards together though well the reason is because i do tend to splash these red cards in blue green a lot or vice versa i'll splash repulsive mutation in blue red sometimes evans examiner i'm a little bit 
less happy about splashing. It's just a little bit less impactful if you don't play it you know, kind of early in the game where you can start really collecting evidence. Repulsive Mutation is really a card that I'm much happier to splash because when you finally find your green mana, um, it's still going to be very, very impactful. But this has just been my jam. Like, this core, you don't need rares. It's great if you have rares, of course, but this collection of four excellent cards that all play very well together, and I'm going to repeat again, if you're drafting flexibly, if you're taking fixing early, Gravestone Striders and Escape Tunnels, when you go to green, you've got Topiary Panther and Nervous Gardener. These are cards to help you play these red cards. It's really not that difficult to reap the rewards of all these underrated cards or all these underdrafted cards and put them all in the same deck. Like you get all of these cards, which are essentially rare level cards. Maybe Evidence Examiner is, is a bit below that, but I think all these cards are extremely powerful. And, and I think these have kind of become the, the white aggro deck of week one, where it's just like, yeah, I'm kind of just expecting to see this. Now, obviously not as much because they are uncommons. It's not quite the same effect, but it's got the same vibe. You know, it's, it's kind of what I'm getting at as, as far as reliability of drafting these. So here's an example deck I have in front of me. For those just uh, listening along, I'll do my best to illustrate what's going on. But of course, you can check out the YouTube channel if you do want a visual. This is a blue-red deck. It's got Gear Drake and Satchel. It's got some Granite Witnesses. It does have a nice rare and Lamplight Phoenix. But then I'm splashing Repulsive Mutation. I'm splashing Evidence Examiner. I'm also splashing Izoni. Like, my, my mana base did get kind of wild here. But I was able to get a little bit wild because I have... Two escape tunnels I picked up early. A gravestone strider I picked up early. A public thoroughfare to tie the room together. A bunch of card drawn filtering so that I can cast my cards. I can pitch cards I can't cast. Find my mana. This is the exact kind of deck I'm talking about when I mentioned earlier. Just trying to get all the good cards into your deck later in the format. Because it's not going to be easy to do so in just two colors. So you branch out to three or four colors. Also, a second deck here. I just kind of want to kind of highlight the power of Evidence Examiner. Because this is a little bit of a strange deck. It's a four-color deck that's just a pile of removal and evidence examiners. I've got three evidence examiners, and often I will not advocate for the pile of removal decks because what happens when you cast a bunch of removal spells is you go kill your thing, kill your thing, kill your thing, and then if you don't have a great thing to take over the game past then, uh, a bomb, a good rare, something that closes the game after you've controlled the game, your opponent's just going to draw into more threats eventually, and then you're going to run out of removal, and you haven't really made any forward progress in the game. But when you have triple evidence examiner, you can then regas back up, just draw a million cards, and you've used a lot of spells, you've put stuff in the graveyard because you're casting removal spells. I've got shocks and galvanizes and reasonable doubts, and I'm splashing uh, Extract Confession, the Sacrifice a Creature in black. And Evidence Examiner also plays very well in multiples. I mean, a lot of the cards that I talked about, those four uncommons, Gear Drake plays well in multiples too. But Evidence Examiner specifically plays great in multiples because they trigger off of each other. And you only have to collect evidence once to get two clues if you have two of them in play. So let me talk about how I'm getting into these decks. And uh, I definitely am kind of biasing towards them a little bit. But like I said, I'm willing to draft anything. I'm still being flexible. A lot of my drafts do start green though, or at least like maybe not first picking a green card. Sometimes I do, but second, third, fourth picking. Once you get to the middle of the pack and you realize, okay, this is a pod that might still be undervaluing some of the green cards. You go, okay, I'm picking up my bite downs and my Vitugazi inspectors, my, my locks on eavesdroppers. I'm getting those middle of the pack. Okay, I, I can see green is a thing that I'm doing. I, I really highly prioritize Nervous Gardener, the 2-2 the two, two disguise creature that flips up and gets a land. And I similarly prioritize Topiary Panther pretty highly. Not as highly as Nervous Gardener. But I've third picked this card a lot lately. Like, this is a card that I'm happy to have. Again, that flexibility, fixing, triggers your evidence cards. I'll, I just had a lot of drafts where I just kept going, man, I wish I had a panther or two. And the more I was just taking them highly, just putting them on my deck, the more the happier I ended up being. Tunnel Tipster is fine. The, the two mana, one one, the taps to make a green mana. I do really think you need to have disguise creatures in your deck to really be happy with this card. Uh, I want to trigger it a few times. I want like a minimum four disguise creatures to, to make sure I really get good value out of it. And in the decks that I'm drafting, I do value this a little bit lower than the other cards that I, I mentioned because it's not all about speed, right? It's not all about just like power out of four drop, power out of five drop. Sometimes you've got a bunch of Loxodons and playing Loxodon turn three is good. Maybe you have a Killer Among Us playing that turn early is good. It doesn't fix for colors, so that's a little bit of a knock uh, of the kind of card I, I'd want to take early. And I'm still happy to put the card in my deck. Like, speed is one thing, but also just the ability to keep spending mana as the game goes on. Like, if you're a blue-green deck, a ton of ways to spend your mana, and you just know every single turn you're going to be tapping the tipster, 
that's totally fine too. I just kind of want to temper some expectations because I do think that other people value this card a little bit higher than I do. And then the two combat strikes, Fanatical Strength, the plus three, plus three, and Trample, and especially Get a Leg Up. I, I think that these two cards, Get a Leg Up, by the way, the, the uncommon single green mana target creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature you control and gains reach. I think that both of these cards, people kind of view as aggro cards maybe because they, they just go really, really late. Get a Leg Up is still one of the most underrated cards in the set. It's great. It's one of green's best uncommons. And I still see it routinely wheeling sometimes, routinely going seventh, eighth pick. I think this just might be the combat trick bias people have where they just kind of see combat tricks as lesser cards, but it's just a great card. Same with Fanatical Strength. I do like Get a Leg Up a little bit more because it can really turn into a win condition where you just kind of do the math and you're like hey my opponent's a 10 i just have to get them into position where they tap down and i get one unblocked creature or my flyer gets in a few times and i finish them off and, and you can do that starting from like a pretty high life total like i i think about those situations my opponent's at 15 a lot of the time and i don't think it's a stretch to say that green is the best color in the set right now if you're factoring in the price you're paying for cards of a certain color what i mean by that is Sure, in the abstract, if you were to give me 20 random white commons or 20 random green commons, I would prefer the 20 random white commons because I think if you're just like building a sealed pool, there's nobody else influencing the, the strength of the cards you're going to get. Yes, pound for pound, the white cards are better, but people take the white cards way, way, way higher than the green cards and the green cards i don't think are that much worse than the white cards let's talk blue now because blue is the color that is shared by my two favorite color combinations and i think there are quite a few underrated blue commons so i want to start with projector inspector and this is not a surprise this is not a a revolution or anything this is the three mana three two in blue that when it or another detective enters or is turned face up you get to loot this is a blue common i am excited to take like i i will actively be pulled into blue because of this card it fills up your grave for your evidence, which I think is increasingly important in the decks that I'm playing. It also helps you find your best cards, and that can be very helpful when you do have one of those medium drafts where you didn't pick up a lot of great cards. You have maybe two or three good cards that you picked up early in certain packs, and this just lets you draw those cards a little more often. It also plays very, very well with two high rarity cards that uh, I tend to get past or take early. One of them is Prof's Eidetic Memory, which is the rare two mana blue enchantment that ETBs draws a card, and then at the beginning of your combat, you put X plus one plus one counters on target creature where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn. So Projector Inspector is just a great source of constant card flow. Private Eye, another card. This is the blue, white, golden common three, three, gives your detects plus one plus one. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, target detective can't be blocked this turn. Of course, that plays very well with uh, Projector Inspector too. And this isn't just a blue, white card to me. I take this card pretty early, but I'm very happy to splash it in like a blue, green deck and kind of be like a, a, a Bance deck. Maybe I do start white i first picked a novice inspector into a private eye white ends up being cut i'm happy to splash both the private eye and the novice inspector most of the time private eye also plays very well with green cards because your green cards tend to be a bit bigger so the unblockability means that they're gonna get in bigger hits of damage and i guess private eye kind of exemplifies something that i think about as the format goes on and just kind of like sideways synergies or synergies that you don't normally encounter because at the beginning of the format I, at least for myself i'm closer to playing two colors than three or four and then when you start combining cards of different colors you start to notice these small synergies which is kind of cool and then as far as other blue commons go there's cold case cracker and out cold both of these people know are good and i'm, I'm happy to have these in my deck out cold a little bit more when i'm like a green blue deck with giant creatures that i cap down their stuff and i, I get in a big hit i'm a little bit less happy if i'm like a, a blue red kind of controlling deck totally fine there but uh, not not as much of a priority and then three blue commons that I do like that I, I think are a little bit underrated. Deduce being one of them, the two mana draw card investigate. Games are a little bit slower uh, as the format goes on because once again, people don't have as streamlined decks. I'm not saying they're glacial, but they're a tick slower, just enough slower that I have to play a, a good draw spell like Deduce. Of course, it makes an artifact, which a lot of my decks are caring about that reasonable doubt is one that i've just come up and up and up on this is the two mana instant counter target spell unless they pay two and you can suspect up to one target creature which almost never happens but just a fine card to put in the two drop slot sort of counterintuitively i don't want this card in my hard control decks very often because when you're playing a controlling deck you do go quite long and this can become a dead card if you have projector inspectors i am more happy to play it because then you can loot it away when it's bad but kind of just like out cold i'm happier to play this in like a blue green deck that maybe is a little bit late on two drops 
rather than a pure controlling deck. And then unauthorized exit. This is the blue bound spell, return target and all land permanent to its owner's hand. So rail one, yeah, just, just happy to have this card. It's, it's really flexible, cheap. Don't forget this does say non-land permanent. So sometimes that comes up, you're able to bounce a buried in the garden or a makeshift binding, something that's just kind of been sitting there. And of course they can cast that the next turn. But a lot of time I'm like, well, if I just cast this on the makeshift binding that has my cold case cracker under it, I get to get in for a big hit or maybe that cold case cracker is the three lethal damage I needed. So just don't forget that this is not just creatures, unauthorized exit does hit non-land permanence. And if you'll notice, the last four cards I talked about, Out Cold, Deduce, Reasonable Doubt, and Unauthorized Exit, are all instants. So that's another little layer of synergy that you're happy. Just have a, a nice instant package, which, of course, plays well as clues as well. So I'm going to hold off talking about red, the third color, and then the teamer shard for a second. And I want to talk about the two colors I don't draft that much anymore, and that's white and black. And when I say I don't draft them much anymore, it's not like I don't get white cards into my deck. It's not that I don't get black cards. Like, I'm still being flexible. I'm still open to what's open in the draft. I also do splash these colors quite a bit. It's just that it's pretty rare these days that I'm a base black or a base white deck. With white, I think it's pretty simple. I, I think it is still just pretty overdrafted. Even good players, I think, are just starting out thinking, okay, well, I will try to get into the best color, and then if it's not open, I'll move off of it. I've just been happier not in participating in that rat race kind of like just being like i mean sure you're like yeah okay i'll take uh an ever so slightly worse green or blue card over a white card like i'm not saying pass up on novice inspectors pick one pack one if, if that's the best card in the pack and there's nothing close you, you shouldn't do that you should definitely take the novice inspector but if there's like a makeshift binding or an inside source compared to like a shock compared to a bite down on crime or a projector inspector or especially one of those good gold uncommons that i've been talking about which is less flexible than just taking a, a good mono white card but I, I do think pays you out because white tends to be overdrafted and those other colors tend to be slightly underdrafted i guess what i'm trying to get out here is don't feel bad about not taking a white card pick one pack one if there's other options in the pack that you want to kind of feel around, feel out, let other people fight for white. I'm also not advocating for avoiding white. Like, if you're somebody who's had a lot of good success still drafting the white aggro decks, like, keep doing what you're doing. I'm just saying for the people that have been doing that, going in, hoping, oh, maybe white's going to be open this time. I just had success just kind of skirting around it, not really worrying about it, not making egregious picks. I, I want to really stress that. Just biasing away in some places. And as a result of white being overdrafted, a lot of its good cards actually get quite a bit worse. So I'll point out something like Season Consultant, which is the two mana one three that when it attacks with three more creatures, it gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. Carl of Watchdog, it's the uncommon four mana three two vigilance that when you attack with three things, your team gets plus one plus one on the job, the plus two plus one of the team and investigate. If you don't have novice inspectors or inside sources or dog walkers, these cards that do get snapped up really early, these cards all get worse because your season consultants don't attack for three as often. Your card of watch dogs come down on four when you don't have three creatures. You know, it's like, it, it kind of creates this cascading effect. I think on the drop still a generically good card, but it's a worse card than it was on week one when you just got all those cards. And then we get to black. And, and black is, I think, firmly the worst color. It started as the worst color. I think it is ending the format as the worst color. I mean, it kind of had a funny trajectory where I didn't want to touch it early in the format, first two weeks, because it was very overdrafted relative to how good the cards were. It's the classic, everybody first picks murder and then doesn't move off at issue. But then people address it, they're like, oh, hey, black's not that good. And you could get pretty good black decks where people didn't touch black at the table. Now it's swung back around where I think people are like, hey, maybe this is one of those drafts where black is going to be open because nobody else wants the cards. Those happen from time to time, but I found more often than not, black isn't open to a degree that I'm happy drafting it. And it has to be more open than the other colors because it is less good than the other colors. The one black deck I do still really like is green black. I think the chalk outline and insidious root stuff is still quite strong, is still quite good. I'm also uh, Team Sirkovitz for, for the Aftermath Analyst, uh, the two mana 1-3 that mills three cards and you can pay for, bring all the lands back from your graveyard. I, th I think this is a good card in these like black green self mill decks. If you, know, if you don't know what I'm referencing here, uh, on the one of the recent episodes of Limited Resources, Marshall and uh, Sirkovitz ha had a little bit of a uh, discussion or argument about this card. Mom and dad were fighting and Marshall was advocating for this is probably not a card you should put in your deck. And I, I agree, a lot of the time you shouldn't, but these black green decks, Definitely in the home from when you, you care about the self mill, you care about spending a bunch of mana as the game goes on. And like always, I will really just reiterate words of caution for Insidious Root and Chalk Outline. 
I like these cards. I like them when my deck is good for them, though. And for a deck to be good for them, you have to have probably more triggers than you think you have to have. I'm looking for 9, 10, 11 cards to trigger these cards. It's a little bit less for Chalk Outlaw. I can get away with like 8 or 9. But for Insidious Roots, where you need to trigger it 2, 3, 4 times to be happy with it, you gotta be triggering it every single turn. And one card that I've been talking up today, and I will talk up one more time, Gravestone Strider. Gravestone Strider has that additional ability. Two mana, exile it from the grave to exile target creature from a graveyard. Really great because you get two triggers off of the Gravestone Strider. You exile it, you exile another creature from your grave, boom, two triggers from your Chalk Outline, which is actually very impactful. If you can play Chalk Outline and this in the same turn, exile, you know, on turn six, you exile something from your grave, you get two two twos plus two clues. Yeah, you're really doing it. And then this swings us back around to red. And, and the reason I want to talk about red last is I did want to talk about white first because I think red's got a bit of the same issue as white does where a lot of its cards, or a few of its cards, I will say, got worse because you don't get consistently good aggro deck. The two drops aren't flying around the table anymore. And because of that, something like the Chase is on, which is the three mana plus three plus so first strike investigate card. Card's still a fine card, but I'm not like fourth picking it like I might have on week one where I'm just getting a bunch of awesome two drops and you really punish your opponent. Also, people know to how to play around these tricks. Chase is on, Auspicious Arrival, on the job. They know how to play around them a bit better, so they get a little bit worse. Red Herring, kind of the same thing. The 2-2 two, two for 2 that has haste and has to attack each turn of Able. This is a card that's, you know, playable in your, like, blue-red controlling clue, care about artifact deck. But since it's harder to have a deck that supports this card, you just need to have a really low curve, really be aggressing on the opponent, making sure you have all these tricks, all these twos. It does kind of crumble in on itself when your deck doesn't quite get there. You're like just below the number of things you need. You didn't pick up quite enough cheap things. You got some clunkers in your deck. All these aggressive cards just get a little bit worse. Person of interest, this is the four man two two that comes with a uh, two two that suspects itself. This card, I I'm still pretty happy to play. I think even in my like not hard control decks, you don't want like a four mana two two blocker, but in my kind of like more tempo-y blue red decks where it's like, yeah, I'm maybe not playing an aggro game. I'm casting some removal spells early, but then I'm then pushing damage in the mid game with some reasonable sized threats. Like person of interest is still a fine card. I'm still relatively high on this one, but I do see red as more of a support color these days with shock and galvanize being excellent in blue red, just two of the most important cards and even suspicious detonation, the five mana sorcery can't be countered cost three less if uh, you sacked an artifact this turn it deals four damage like this is a card that i'm happy to play my blue red deck you get it really really late you don't have to pick it early but it makes it into more decks these days than red herring does let me let me put it that way and i think that basically covers my thoughts on how i'm approaching the format right now just to boil it down a little more i'm, I'm biasing towards teamer I'm biasing away from black and white. I try to stay flexible in pack one by taking cards that are easy to splash, taking fixing, staying flexible by the cards I'm picking, but also flexible mentally, thinking, well, I'm not locking into this color pair. I could add a third color. I could add a fourth color. I could pivot if I really want to. Keep an eye out for multicolor decks. I've had five color decks. I've had four color decks. They've been pretty good. They definitely are successful or not successful based on the amount of fixing I've picked up, but the way I'm drafting, that's usually not that big of an issue. And I guess overall, just like stay open a little bit longer. If you are somebody who finds themselves locking in pick five, pick six, and you're like, all right, I guess this is what I'm kind of doing and I'll just keep on doing it. I think you're going to find a lot more success if you can employ some of the things I've been talking about today, keeping yourself open to the idea of pivoting or adding more colors as you get to pack two, keeping your eye out for those powerful cards that get passed to you. Because I do know sometimes when you get locked into a certain color pair, you kind of become blind in some ways to good cards. Like you're like, okay, well, I'm just I'm just looking for the, the green and white cards in this pack. If you think you're green, white by the end of pack one, and you miss out on maybe even a good splash or a pulse of mutation, evidence examiner, something like that. And, and instead you take kind of a crappy card. Maybe you take like, you know, like a due diligence or something because it's the only white card in the pack when there's other options. There's ways to make your deck more powerful as it goes on. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope uh, this was helpful for people still drafting the format. Even if you're not still drafting the format every day or anything like that, hopefully you picked up some tips along the way that you can apply to other formats. Thank you as always for watching and listening. I've got one more podcast coming out before the Thunder Junction set review. It's going to be the second week of April. Stay tuned. I will definitely have some dates for that. I think we're recording that on the 8th and the 9th and of course it'll be out soon after that. So uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff. Going to be putting out some like primer type of content on the YouTube channel for Thunder Junction in the new future. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye everybody.